I'm Terry, and I love to play tennis, usually with uh, three other friends, so doubles is a big one. I also love to cycle. Uh, down on the Martin Goodman Trail, all along the bottom of the city. It's a long trail with lots of beautiful scenery, so I really do enjoy that. And I love hanging out with friends, either just going for coffee or having a meal with good friends. I really enjoy that. Years ago, there was a movement called, well, WWJD, and what it stood for was, what would Jesus do? And there was a lot of people who would put the WWJD on their T-shirts, or they would actually have wristbands and they would wear those. I've even seen somebody, some people tattoo it on their wrist or their arm. And oftentimes there were Bible covers with the initials WWJD, and it was just, something that made people stop and think and be a reminder of, in certain situations, what would Jesus do? So Saturday mornings, my best friend and I would go for brunch, and it was pretty much an open door policy with other friends. We usually have an average of maybe at least four, maybe five. Single people, couples, sometimes couples would bring their kids just an understanding that Saturday mornings, 10 a.m., you can show up at that point in time and you're welcome to join us for brunch. So one Saturday, one of the friends showed up, Andre, and he simply said that uh, he's going to need a kidney. One was non-functioning and the other one needed to be replaced. My immediate reaction was simply, how do I find out if I'm a match? So he literally just turned to me and said, when are we gonna do this? I just could not believe it. We don't expect that coming from your best friend or anybody else. Like, you know, I was in shock, actually. This was a friend in need. And later when people asked me, well, you know, how did you make that decision? And I think back to what would Jesus do? And it made it really simple, because I know Jesus would give his kidney. So we booked the surgical date, and we went in for the surgery. He just decided that it would not be a big deal for him, and he just did what he had to do to, to help me, and I'm very thankful for it, you know? I can tell you one thing, it takes guts to be gentle and kind, and those are the things Terry are. I was told when I did this that recovery would be somewhere between six weeks and three months. And actually, oddly enough, I remember it was almost six weeks to the day when I realized that I was back to myself. Since I got McKinney, things are going great, I mean, I feel like I got a second chance, to be honest, second chance in life, you know? Some friends and family said this seemed to be a big deal. But when I consider all that Jesus has done for me, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> when I consider all that Jesus has done for me and all that he sacrificed for me, it seemed like a simple thing to do. And I just really hope and pray that my friends will see this demonstration of God's love and his kindness towards me. That is something that is there for all of us. Oh man. Like, come on, what an amazing story of giving your kidney, of self-sacrifice, of a love for another, of thinking about processing what would Jesus do and what does Jesus ask me to do in my everyday walking around life, that following Jesus, being a disciple of Christ, embodying the love of the divine in Jesus is not just like a head a philosophical 
or even an emotional exercise, it like makes its way into or should make its way into our bodies to give and serve and love and care uh, and to embody uh, compassion. You're getting me sermonizing before the even sermon. So welcome. Uh, glad you're joining us here. Welcome to The Meeting House. My name is Jimmy. I'll be your live stream host this morning. Um, shout out to those of you on our Discord channel. If you are checking us out there, if you've never heard of that before, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash discord. If you're live there in the chat, say hi to somebody that you've never met before. Tell them like what kind of coffee or tea you're drinking uh, this morning. It's just such a gift to be together. I want to read you something from uh, Philippians chapter 1. I think it speaks to so much of uh, what we're going to experience this morning and then also speaks to with the gentleness of God, like what we're processing through um, and this season of the life of our church that we're in. So here's how it goes. Philippians chapter 1. Again, Paul's writing this to a group of like young converts to this new way of Christ that will require their entire lives even through the journey of suffering. And Paul is like in chains, literally. He's, he's writing this letter to this, uh, this small church, and he says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So brothers and sisters, wherever you're at, whether, uh, you know, here in Ontario or Canada or around the world, uh, we are thankful to be together as a church family, that every time we remember that we're part of a larger body family of God, we can embody thankfulness of, of graciousness, of thanksgiving for uh, the people that we link arms with and the ways that we're invited to be more like Jesus in our everyday walking around life, whether we're offering somebody a coffee, some spare change, or a kidney. Uh, these are the markers of, of the Jesus life that's alive and well in us. Um, honestly, uh, for me personally, as one of your pastors, I'm, I'm thankful for uh, the time to process genuinely in community together. Um, and we continue to be a church, uh, honestly, in transition, walking through uh, different pain points, different like uh, ups and downs on the topography of the life of our church in this season. And you may have received an email from our overseers regarding Carmen and our leadership process over this last little while. Um, and yeah, it's a journey, isn't it? It's a process and we need each other uh, to lean in together and to, to have confidence to continue to pray for wisdom and discernment for the life of our church and what God is doing, that we would have uh, eyes to see, ears to ha hear, and hearts that will like follow, continuing uh, in the confidence that the God who started this will bring it to fulfillment uh, in our life with Jesus, in our life uh, as a community as we follow Jesus together. Um, so yeah, we're, it, it's a gift to be together, to listen, to learn. We're going to jump into uh, some worship through music here in just a second, and then some teaching about reconciliation. How are we reconciled towards each other, even in transition, in conflict, in the unknown? But just from my heart to yours, uh, like I said, it is a gift. I am glad for you. I'm glad to be here with you. I'm glad for safe, authentic, transparent a space that we don't say as a church, oh, we've got it all together, we've got this all figured out. We say, sometimes we just don't know. But what we do know is that we can be confident in the love of God made perfect in Jesus that's saturating our community. And so, brothers and sisters, wherever you're at this morning, I thank God every time I remember you. I'm always filled with thankfulness in my heart, and I'm confident that the God who began this good work in us will bring it to joyful completion uh, in Jesus. Yeah. Let's jump into uh, some worship through music. Anna and team, uh, over to you. Look at this. There's a clap, right? Listen, you are of the select few that made it on time this morning. Give yourselves a hand this morning. Just give yourselves a hand. This is it. We appreciate you. We also appreciate the people that will be trickling in late. We're so happy that we get to do this together, to worship God, to be reminded of who he is, who we are in him. So I invite you to stand if you are able, and we are going to sing and worship God this morning.
Tech team might kill me, but we're going to sing those bridges again, and we're going to sing that, the chorus again. Because this is good news this morning. I know that we come in, and 9.30 is still a little early, especially on a long weekend. I get it. And sometimes we hit, like, a fast song first thing, and you're like, guys, listen, band, I appreciate your energy, but, like, I haven't woken up yet. I get it. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. But this is good news this morning. I am forgiven. I am your friend. I am accepted. I know who I am. Nothing changes that this morning. Nothing changes who you are in God. That even when we come in feeling low and empty and feeling like we're not good enough, he makes us good enough. It is in him that we live and we move and we have our being. So this morning, even if we're a little bit draggy, even if we're a little bit tired, even if we're like, oh God, I hate fast songs, I want you to sing this out. I want you to celebrate because this is good news. This is why we love Jesus. This is why we come to church in the morning to be reminded and be encouraged about who God is. So let's sing these bridges again. I am accepted. I am forgiven. I am your friend.
morning, Jesus. We worship you this morning. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to this space this morning. Welcome to church. First Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 9 says this. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So what does it mean for you to be treasured by God? You see, this is a God that spoke the universe into existence. He created the land and the sea, the night and the day, the stars in the sky, the creatures on this land. And yet nowhere in the Bible does it say that these are his treasured possessions. You are his treasured possessions. You are precious in his sight, Isaiah 43. You are his beloved children, 1 John 3. You are engraved on the palm of his hands, Isaiah 49. His love for you is unshakable and unchangeable, Romans 8. He treasures you enough to put flesh and blood on. He treasures you enough to live a human life. He treasures you enough to tie himself to humanity forever. He treasures you enough to die in your place. So before we continue to sing and worship, I want you to just sit with a couple of questions. If you were absolutely convinced that you were what God treasured most, how would it change your life? How would it change your life? Would it change how you trust him through the hard times? Would it change how you see yourself? And in our setting this morning, would it change the way you worship him? If you truly, truly believed you were what he treasured the most. God, we just sang a song that says, I know who I am, I am yours. I am your beloved. I am the one that you take pride in, that you look down on and say, that's, that's my child. And God, when we really truly recognize that, it really is life-changing. It is foundational. It is core to who we are. And I pray, God, that as we worship this morning, as we receive this information, God, we would equally respond greatly to say, thank you, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for changing us. We worship you this morning. In your name I pray. Amen.
Speak. I heard. 
stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your words, then so
Reconciliation is not a set of principles to be followed, but a life to be lived. Jim Van Eperen. We seek reconciliation with the neighbor, not because we feel so much better afterward, but because reconciliation is what God is doing in the world through Christ. Stanley Hauerwas. Loving your neighbor is the easiest when there's very little difference. Loving your neighbor is the easiest when they believe like you do, vote like you do, shop where you do, have the same economic status you do, and send their children to the same schools you do. The smaller the gap between you, the easier the bridge is to build. The biggest need for bridge building, however, is when the gap is the biggest. Yet the degree of difficulty in loving our neighbor doesn't excuse us from loving that neighbor. Shirley V. Hoogstra. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Challenging sermons in complicated times.com. Okay. Ooh, that's good. Ooh, good. Oh, sorry. Caught me in some last minute sermon prep there. My apologies. But you know what? I think it's going to be okay because it is a good week and a good day every week and every day to gather together to know and become more like Jesus. Every week and every day is a good day to do that. And there's purpose to us being here this morning together. So welcome to the second week in our series, We Are Here. We are here. Here we are. It's true. We're taking a look at some of the things God's been saying to us as a church in between legs on this extreme adventure called following Jesus and being a church community together. And you know what's interesting about extreme adventures is they don't just tend to happen individually as a solo exercise, do they? It's a team sport. And what happens is throughout an extreme adventure, our relationships are tested, they're tried, aren't they? Because we're activated emotionally and spiritually and mentally as a community of people journeying towards something together. And through that testing and trying, Bonds can be built that are inseparable as well. And the same thing is even so much more true for us as a community of people stumbling forward and following Jesus together and learning what it means to do that, isn't it? The God that we serve right from the inception of time itself and predating that in a way that we can't even really understand is inherently relational. And we are made in that image. We're given this beautiful metaphor in scripture of us being a body together, each of us being a separate part that's important and has a role to play. And if we're a body together, maybe relationships are like the sinews and the ligaments that actually hold us together. And just like in any extreme adventure, those relationships can be tested and they can be tried by external factors that are beyond our control and also by internal dynamics as well. But if we're to be a body operating as one together, that means the business of reconciliation, of constantly rebuilding and healing 
and working together isn't just a one-time experience or a sermon on a Sunday. It's core to our existence and our DNA as a church community. And so talking about reconciliation seems just so fitting for us as a church as we take inventory of the things that God's been saying to us in recent months. And it's healthy to orient ourselves to a topic like this because it just seems so big, doesn't it? When we hear reconciliation, many of us will think of and associate that with different things. We'll think about the big picture, hopefully, because it's important. We'll think about things like reconciling with our indigenous neighbors. We'll think about racial reconciliation. We'll think about maybe even reconciliation between countries and nations at war. That's good. That's good to zoom out and think about God's reconciling plan for humanity at large. We come closer to home and we think about reconciliation as it relates to our story as a church. We've just been going through the process of understanding and telling our story to understand where we've been so that we can move forward together with Jesus at the lead. And we see moments of need for reconciliation that still exist to this day throughout our history as a church. Repairing and restoring relationships with one another where there's been hurt and tension. We think about the last year. And we recognize that we've experienced hurt. You may have experienced hurt. The person sitting next to you may have experienced hurt or brokenness or tension or confusion that requires reconciliation. You may feel like you need reconciliation to this church, the meeting house. We as a church have experienced hurt as well. In all directions, reconciliation is a 360 degree part of our identity as a community both with us and with God. So this is a message and a theme and a core part of who we are as a church right now in our moment. We're speaking to ourselves, but it's also something that's much bigger than us and is fundamental to our life as those following Jesus or exploring what it means to follow Jesus. You know, oftentimes we talk as Christ followers, about our personal relationship with Jesus. And that's important. Yes and amen. Save your cards and letters. <laughs> but isn't it fascinating when we study the early church, how often this concept of one anothering is actually really the priority. There's over 100 references in the New Testament alone to what it means for us to one another well. In your notes this week, there's a few examples. Be at peace with one another, Mark 9, 50. Be devoted to one another in love, Romans 12, 10. Be of the same mind with one another, Romans 12, 6. Through love, serve one another, Galatians 5, 13. Bear with and forgive one another, Colossians 3, 13. Confess your sins to one another, James 5, 16. As long as we're a body, and as long as we have relationships holding us together, our one anothering is going to be core to who we are and a priority for us as a church. And sometimes that involves an especial emphasis on the process of reconciliation. And yet even the topic itself, we need to approach with humility, realizing we don't have it all figured out. Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 23, to people who would have maybe been used to journeying a long way to offer their sacrifices on a physical altar. He says this, if we can put that up on the slide. And even if we can't, we can paraphrase. So if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Before we even go about the business of coming before God, Jesus is saying, hey, your relationships with one another matter. Loving one another is part of what it means to love me and vice versa. So even today, we come humbly saying, hey, let's start by checking our own hearts. Let's pause and catch our impulse to to talk and react and put ourselves in a posture of listening to what Jesus has to say to us and taking deep comfort in that truth. So reconciliation can be a bit of a word soup, can't it? It can be confusing and we can ascribe different definitions to the words that we use 
when we talk about something like reconciliation, there's forgiveness and confession and repentance and restitution. So how do we go about understanding what reconciliation even is? Well, at its core, of course, it means bringing back together things that have been separated. And that is a good place to start. But for us, it's so much more than that, isn't it? We talked last week about Jesus' prayer for us, his hope for us being a community that is united together in our oneness in him. And if that's true, if our purpose, as we've been saying, is to know and experience the transformation of becoming more like Jesus together, then reconciliation isn't just a nice to have. It's not just something on our to-do list as Christians. It's actually fundamental as an ingredient to our purpose. So let's turn, to, let's turn to Scripture together and dig into this a bit more. We're going to read from Ephesians 2, verse 14 to 17. Ephesians is near the back of the Bible. I'm not going to sing it again, but it is very close to Philippians. There's a hint. Let's center ourselves on Jesus and see what he has to say to us through Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, starting in verse 14. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Reconciliation starts with our submission to Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. As I was preparing for this week, I was reminded how often and when was the last time I actually sat with the beauty and depth of love that was demonstrated on the cross when Jesus sacrificed himself for us. If we're Jesus-centered people, then at the center of a Jesus-centered people is Jesus on the cross as the defining moment of our faith. Not because he was killed by his father so he could get a pound of flesh, but because he voluntarily entered into the most beautiful and perfect sacrifice ever in the history of humanity because he loved us that much. We can't even start a conversation about reconciliation until we submit to the power of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Here's the one person in the history of time who had every right in that moment, to be reminding people why he was right, fighting back, challenging decisions that were made. And what does he do? He lays it down, not because he was manipulated, voluntarily as an act of sacrifice, loving us, praying for forgiveness for those who are persecuting him all the way until his dying breath. That just arrests me. It arrests me in my desire to make sure people know I'm right, to push back against a decision that I don't understand, to fight and to fight and to fight. That's just not the way Jesus did it. In this act we see in verse 16, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death. This act of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross first and foremost reconciles us to God. But reconciling with God is not an independent exercise from reconciling with one another as we sometimes talk about it. The act of Jesus' death on the cross reconciles us to him and, and, 
puts our hostility towards each other to death. Now, the context here is this church in Ephesus has some Jews who are converting to the new Jesus way, but a lot of Gentiles, which is just a word to say, hey, these are people who weren't part of the nation of Israel, and by way of their geography and their history, have been excluded from this whole God conversation up until this point. And Jesus is saying, the power of what I've done on the cross through Paul's letter can break down any dividing wall between you, reconcile you to me and to each other. Wow. And so how much more for us today as we look at one another and say, who are the people that are just so other than me because of what they've done, because of what I've done, because of the beliefs and ideas that we have that I couldn't ever imagine being reconciled with them. And the beauty of what Jesus has done on the cross is that, yes, you can imagine being reconciled with them, not by your own strength, but because Jesus has made it possible. His death on the cross blows our minds with this mysterious cosmic significance that allows our sin to be forgiven and allows us to be released from it in a way that we're reconciled with him. But it also paints an example for us of what perfect love looks like and a call to us to live like that with one another. The beauty of the cross. And what happens? Verse 18 says it so beautifully. Now what? All of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. This is us continuing the conversation about what it means to be a centered set community. We're not making that up as a model. We're interpreting what we're hearing in Scripture as the way we are to live together. We can come to the Father together with the Holy Spirit inside of us and around us and alive among us because of what Christ has done for us. And the context for reconciliation is always community, isn't it? Step one to reconciliation is actually investing in and building a community that's worth reconciling once brokenness emerges, which it always will. And superficial community crumples under the weight of conflict because we realize, well, what's the point in reconciling? There's no motivation. There's nothing for us to go back to if we haven't been working to build a strong community in the meantime. And in that sense, reconciliation is not just a reactive practice. It needs to be part of our core daily life, the way that we see, the way that we exist as Christ followers. Romans 12, 2 paints this beautiful image of our minds being renewed and transformed through the Holy Spirit. But why? for the purpose of us understanding God's will and changing our lives. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It doesn't stop there. Then what? Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This business of reconciliation and working through our relationships is an ongoing part of what it means to follow Jesus. His goal for us is change lives as we transform to be more like him. So what does this mean and what does it look like? Well, maybe we can start with a few counterfeit imitations. Beware of imitations of real reconciliation. The world offers us a few tools. The world offers us the tool of silence and sweeping things under the rug. When relational breakage happens, when hurt happens, when oppression happens. Why? So generally we can preserve the status quo and our power structures and our institutions and not rock the boat. That doesn't sound a whole lot like what we've been learning about how Jesus calls us to live. The world offers us the tool of canceling one another. The self-righteous act of saying, we're right, that person or people group are wrong, and therefore, they're shut out from the conversation. Hmm, tempting on the surface, but doesn't seem to induce a whole lot of transformation or healing. Sometimes as a 
world, we like to legislate the narrative. That's another tool we can use, politically or otherwise, through our institutions and say, hey, everybody, this is the right way to think about it and to be in relationship with one another. Get in line. And even if the narrative is good, that also doesn't really promote a whole lot of transformation or relational work on our part, does it? And even within the church context, we talked last week a little bit about just different ways to understand how we can be tempted to operate as churches. And we talked about this concept of bounded sets. And in a bounded set, we talked about how the energy is placed on the boundary, defining and maintaining the rules, the system of beliefs and behaviors that allow us to belong. And reconciliation in a bounded set environment can often look like a whole lot of truth without as much of the love. And our energy can become focused on doubling down on the rules. Hey, we've had conflict. We've got to get that rule book out. Set everyone straight. And of course, boundaries and standards are healthy, but the overemphasis on truth without love is not what we're taught by Jesus and by the early church. We talked about what a fuzzy set looks like. Often the reaction to a bounded set environment where we take away the boundaries because we don't like how they make us feel. And we're left with confusion and we're left with the currency of tolerance, which is a low bar for a community that wants to focus on love. Fuzzy set environments offer us some counterfeit alternatives to reconciliation. They offer us the idea of just agreeing to disagree. We need to remember that our call is not just to coexist in disagreement. Our call is to unity and oneness in Christ. Our call is mutual submission to one another and to Jesus, which is a whole lot different than just agreeing to disagree. The fuzzy said environment also offers us the ever popular option of forgive and forget. Also tempting. We do the work to forgive, but let's just move on we don't want to do the work to actually restitute. We just want to forgive and move forward. But I want to challenge us that that can be a byproduct of the impatience to restore our own comfort without doing the work to heal. Not a great alternative. So in a Jesus-centered, centered set community, there are a few elements, ingredients to what reconciliation looks like. And these aren't necessarily sequential or linear. Think of it as an ecosystem of things that need to be happening all the time on a bunch of different levels. One of them is confession and repentance. Confession is that process of self-examination for us where we shine light into the darkness of our lives. Not so that we experience shame and guilt, so that we free ourselves from the corrosive force of shame and guilt within us when we are trapped and bonded to the ways that we fall short. We release ourselves from that by confessing our sins and our shortcomings to one another. As James reminds us to in James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another and you'll experience healing. When we shine that light into dark areas of our life, we're also reminded not just of our humility and brokenness, that's important, but even more so, we're reminded that Christ has made us new. He's offered us the remedy. And repentance, of course, we've talked about that in recent weeks, it goes along with confession as the act of acknowledging that we've drifted off path and resetting our GPS to Jesus, making that choice to turn towards him. Forgiveness, of course, is another element of Jesus-centered reconciliation. Forgiveness is that process of us softening our hearts. Ephesians 4.32 reminds us we are to be tender-hearted and kind to one another, forgiving each other as Christ has forgiven us. We remember Christ's gift of forgiveness for us and that softens our hearts and inspires us to forgive one another. This was important enough to Jesus that it was right in that Lord's prayer that he asked us to be praying. Accepting his forgiveness and offering it to one another. 
And sometimes even receiving forgiveness can be a barrier to reconciliation, can't it? We need to offer it, but we also need to be willing to receive it in our own hearts and from one another. So confession and repentance and forgiveness are on the path towards reconciliation. They're elements in an environment of reconciliation, but they're not the totality of reconciliation either. We can't necessarily move past that point on our own. The process is reciprocal, and it involves us working together. And we can't force one another to move past a certain stage. But we can create an environment where the soil is tilled for fertile things to happen through self-examination, through confession, through repentance, through forgiveness. It should never surprise us that we mess up. What should surprise us is how rare of a practice it is in a church to create safe spaces for us to confess and to repent and to forgive one another. And another key element in a Jesus-centered environment of reconciliation is the work of restitution. This is where we actually, in real time and space, with our real bodies and minds and hearts, put work into our relationships to make things right. It takes time, it takes investment, it takes understanding the nuances and the specifics of your context. Not because we're doing it on our own strength, but we do have to partner with the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst to seek restitution. Confession and repentance, forgiveness, and the work to restitute. And there's some more than just footnotes to this conversation that are really important for us to remember. Even through the work of confession and repentance and forgiveness and restitution, while we're not of this world, we are in it. And there are realities that exist around us. We can do the work and invite Jesus' healing power in us and submit to the work of the cross and accept his gift of reconciliation with us and pursue it with one another. But sometimes, healthy boundaries still exist in this earth. Sometimes, the process of rebuilding trust takes time. And sometimes there are reasons why we can't, as much as our hearts would love to see it, just restore things to the way that they were. And my guess is that every one of us wherever we're at in our life, can think of a place and a way that that applies. And it hurts. And I don't have a perfect answer for that. But what I do know is that this is why submitting to Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit is so important. Because only He knows where it is that we need to be convicted where it is that we need to be healed. And this is the scandal, isn't it? He loves both the oppressed and the oppressor so much that in the heart of the oppressed, he wants to bring healing and protection and comfort and a soft heart of forgiveness. And in the heart of the oppressor, he wants to bring conviction and repentance and a commitment to the work of restitution. And you know what's so scandalous? Both end up transforming more into the character of Jesus along the way. And we don't even have to make this stuff up. This also doesn't mean that we're all neutral, equal players when it comes to reconciliation. We need to name that there are systemic injustices. There is oppression. There are acts and instances of offense and oppression in any community, in any set of relationships. Jesus named that very clearly, and we need to as well. We can't force one another to fully repent and take ownership of the things that we've done, but that's a necessary ingredient on the path to reconciliation. So we receive 
what God has given us through the cross. We receive his gift of reconciliation with him and we invite one another to respond. We receive and we respond. We need to respond as a church. Wherever we were at in our journey, we'd need to be having this conversation. But again, we're not circumventing our reality of the last years, year, even the last week. We have a choice to become a church that prioritizes, even in our constant learning as students of the way of Jesus, the process of reconciliation as a core part of who we are. I want to continue that theme of invitation and say, if you want to be a part of a church that's humbly learning what it means to be a reconciling and reconciled community, that's committed to making this a priority, and you want to contribute to that life-changing, restoring, healing way, you're invited. We need to pray. We need to ask God what more we need to do as a church to pursue reconciliation that, with those who have hurt us and who we've been hurt by. And I want to invite us to respond on a personal level as well, today and this week, with a simple but profound practice. I want to invite us to each conduct a relationship exam. This is a great spiritual practice as part of your daily or weekly rhythms. Just ask the question, how are my close relationships? Where do I need to examine my own heart and engage in confession and repentance, soften my heart in forgiveness, giving it and or receiving it? And maybe even in small ways or maybe big ones, take steps towards restitution. And can I find someone to go on that journey with me? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for being a God of love who through your beautiful sacrifice on the cross has made it possible for us to be reconciled to you, even in our brokenness. And thank you that through our reconciliation with you, we can be restored with the hope of reconciliation with one another. May we live and walk in your way as a community that is reconciled and reconciling today and this week. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, I remember a few years ago, I was at this debate with uh, two theologians, and they were like heavy hitters. So typical debate forum, any university setting, they're like up on stage, there's a podium in between, they're on different tables with all these notes and books and whatnot, and uh, they start to go at each other. And both of them, like I said, they're heavy hitters and are not afraid to get after it, as the kids say. And they did. So they're, you know, arguing their points, one side and the other, and back and forth and back and forth forth and it was like pretty fighty and then they got to like the main point of the debate where they differed in a huge way differed uh, and then I'll remember I remember the the punchiest guy in the debate uh, stopped his argument and said you know what like at the end of the day and he looked over at his colleague with whom he differed and said do you love Jesus yes me too do you believe that I love Jesus absolutely without question Great. Do you believe that we could serve, care for each other, and like even uh, take communion together? Absolutely, without question. And then this is the part that got me. He was like, amen. At the end of the day, that's what we focus on. Jesus at the center and being reconciled in relationship, being able to see a brother as a brother or a sister as a sister. That is the point. And then this was the point that just caught me. And as Matt was talking, uh, kind of pinged for me. He said, do you have a few minutes after this? Can we continue this conversation offline? That was the moment for me. It was like, this isn't just showmanship, you know? Being reconciled to each other isn't just for publicity's sake or any relational stunt. Like, it continues uh, offline after the debate is over, after the issue is settled. It's the act of, of God reconciling us in relationship, restoring relationship to one another. 
and it takes time. And it's a rocky road and a bumpy road, sometimes like a victorious, wonderful road, but it takes time. So thank you, Brother Matt, uh, for leading us so well. Uh, lots to think about, certainly in the life of our church in this moment. Uh, how do we continue to be recon reminded that we're, rec we're reconciled and loved by God, loved by the divine, and then also... Man, this is our work to do together as the body of Christ uh, through those peaks and valleys. So anyway, you can see I'm like vibing and riffing off of it right now. I'm sure you will be this week in home church. By the way, if you're not part of a home church uh, online or in your local community, we hope that you will be. That you'll take some time to investigate further, to ask and answer questions, to confess to one another. Um and then just to process relationally, how are we doing? How are you doing? Uh, what are some things that we agree upon? What are some things that we can uh, generously and joyfully uh, debate over? It's just a good um, vehicle in our community of discipleship to be in home church together and to continue the conversation, not just the monologue. I'll mention one other thing, and then uh, we will send you on what I hope is a wonderful rest of your Sunday and rest of your week, but uh, giving. One of the um, sacrificial ways that we support, um, you know, facilitating this live stream, for example, uh, is through giving, is the reason that we can do these kinds of things, that we can have cameras and lights and studio and uh, building and staff and volunteers and training and KidMax and one story, um, you know, uh, things to share is because of folks like you and me who joyfully and generously give. And so if you are giving to the Meeting House, we're so thankful. We do not take that for granted, especially in the season. Uh, if you're in a position right now where you're like, actually, I would love to hear more and maybe start contributing financially to the Meeting House, you can see all the information right there on meetinghouse.com slash give. But like I said, we want this to be a conversation. We don't want giving our money at a church to be like weird. That's part of who we are. Um, and we do so hum humbly, simply, graciously. And so if you have any questions about that, don't be shy. Reach out. All right, brothers and sisters, may you be reconciled to the love of God that exists in uh, our community. Have a great, great rest of your Sunday and a great rest of your week. Peace.